so be, so you go next. We're starting. I over. do. Yeah. Okay. Um, you got so, anything else for us? Sure, sure, sure. I was debating whether or not to uh, mention my third one, but since we're going for a third round here, sure, why not? Um, so the third one that I had in mind is a bit of a departure from the other stuff, but it still kind of has to do with um, with like women in cin cinema and particularly girls in cinema. Um, so the third one that I want to talk about is an anime film called The Adolescence of Utena. And so this is the movie that is a sequel that is not a sequel to the anime TV series, Revolutionary Girl Utena. And so um, basically this film is about these adolescent girls. They're like middle school age. They actually are drawn to look like high schoolers as <laughs> everything was in the 90s with anime. Uh, right. <laughs> that was the style, you know? Uh, <laughs> but um. Utena Tenjo is this uh, girl who is like a complete and total tomboy. She, uh, she's like lusted after by like everybody in the school. They're just like, oh, she's so cool. She's so, so, so cool. Um, because she's like really sporty. She wears a boy's uniform. She just basically breaks all of the rules. Um, everybody loves her except for people who are, you know, jealous of her because she's like that. Um, but uh, she's trying to She's trying to figure out what happened to this boy in her past. Um, and at the same time, she gets to know this girl named Anthe Himamiya, who is obviously supposed to be Indian. Um, and Anthe is this character who is called the Rose Bride. And basically, Anthe is being fought over by all of these like student council kids who do literal sword battles to try to win her and it's absolutely bananas um and it's it's really the series is mostly about the relationship between Utena and Amphi um so it's like this really wonderful explicitly very obviously queer love story that you see between teenage girls um and that's just something that was not being done at the time at all Teresa and, and Isabel, remember that one, Bill? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was that, I didn't hear what you said, what? Yeah, no, it was Radley Metzger. My parents oh, saw it in Metzger. the theater. Yeah. That, yeah, that yeah. was the first teenage girls having an affair shown in America. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You're my so, uh, so this was this was just this like absolutely radical thing um for its mm -hmm. time, and it still holds up remarkably well. Uh I will say that if you haven't seen it and you want to check it out, you have got to watch the series first before you see the movie, because okay. there will be things in the movie that do not make any sense. For example, there's a whole section of the movie where Utena is turned into a car, a literal car, and it makes so much sense if you watch the animated series first before the movie, but without that context, you're just like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> it is incredibly surreal. They do a lot of playing with visuals and symbolism and like there have been a whole academic papers written on this thing it is absolutely nuts um but uh so the the student council thing is going on because every anime about high school and middle school kids has to have like an all-powerful student council that somehow has more power than any of the adults present because that's how school works in the minds yeah. of teenagers we all remember uh <laughs> and so Utena basically accidentally ends up joining this fight over Anthe and then ends up having to compete in these series of duels with all the other student council members. Um, and you find out that uh, when she was little, her parents died and she met this prince uh, who basically cheered her up and um, she admired him so much that she wanted to grow up to be a prince. And so it's like this whole thing, like fucking with gender roles, fucking with um, like straight versus queer relationships. And she basically grows up to be the prince that she admired as a child. But instead of her trying to find the prince because she was in love with the prince, what really happens is that she's fallen in love with Amphi. And it's about them and their relationship and their desire to run away together. And it is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, so that is my all-time animated favorite animated film period wow absolutely it's it's in my top five favorite films period um and the show what as year? Well. amazing what i year have to look that, that up because i don't remember off the top of my head one second <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> i know that i know the anime series was in the early 90s um mm -hmm. uh, da, 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 da. 
1989 is when the movie came oh, okay. out. Yeah. Um, that kind of so, sounds like that era of storytelling. Yeah, and, and, um, and another fun thing about this is the, the director is um, Kunihiko Ikuhara, who mm-hmm. was also very involved with Sailor Moon, um, which, you oh, know, cool. <laughs> I was that generation. I grew up watching Sailor Moon. It was my sure. absolute fan when I was a child, you know, 90s kid and all that. Um, and basically, that one got censored into oblivion, and they basically would not let Ikuhara make Sailor Moon as gay as he wanted to make it. So he basically was like, well, screw you guys, I'm going to go over here and do a new thing, and then he made Utena. And God, it is just so good. It's so, so, so good. So that's that's one that is very important to a lot of queer folks in my generation. So if, you know, anyone in our audience hasn't heard of it, isn't familiar with it, I really want to let more people know that this thing exists because it is phenomenal absolutely absolutely um give me one second i'm yep. doing technical stuff too ah. technical stuff Ooh. It's, it's because I'm, I'm doing everything on the phone you know i don't have a i am so or... grateful at oh, all wow, times that you do technical stuff and i don't have to yeah really <laughs> shout out to henry yeah, <laughs> yeah i mean uh yeah i mean I, i'm 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 almost self-sufficient it would be nice if Dwayne helped me on the every episode. He, you know, like the the first few meetings and the first few episodes, Dwayne, Dwayne and I would meet at the beginning. I don't know if you remember Bill, but he would still stick around for first few minutes before yeah, we started yeah. recording. And then I finally roped him into uh, talking about Old Boy. And then after that, he was like, "I, I, I love getting these movies uh, for you guys. I love doing technical stuff, but." Mm-mm. Doing that on camera anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's not for right, everybody. So, so let me let me what I have a dilemma because I have one movie that is very extreme and far out there. Um and you know, uh, more horror science fiction, psychological, and just downright strange mm-hmm. and groundbreaking. But then I have a movie by Ozu that, you know, is kind of his seminal film. So, Ooh. so I feel like we kind of have to talk about Ozu just because we've like mm-hmm. name dropped him a couple times. Yeah, I guess since we haven't properly covered one of his movies, because I'm dying to cover this other movie, but let, let's go and see what happens here. All right, yeah. so the so the movie that I saw of his was a uh, an autumn afternoon. It came out in 1962. Okay, it was his last movie. Uh, a year after the movie was released, he died. On his 60th birthday, <laughs> he was a head. Uh, he was apparently a very heavy drinker, and uh, drinking is in a lot of his movies. Um, Tokyo Twilight has this element. Uh, his most famous one, I guess, Tokyo Story or Late Spring, is maybe his other most famous, but I haven't seen all that. But, um, basically, you know, it's, it's usually one guy, this actor named Chishu Ryu. Ryu and anybody probably all of y'all would recognize him in some movie he had a 65 year career he was in every ozu movie he was in movies by hiroshi inagaki vom vonders masaki kabayashi akira kurosawa including dreams so yeah uh he was in mishima a life in four chapters by oh, paul schrader hmm. so you know uh but he played the father usually in he was born in 1904 so he played the father in these 40s to 60s movies. Well, 1962 is the last Ozu movie. So it's the last we have of Chishu Ryu corresponding with him. He continued to appear in movies until like 1988 or something. Um, so uh, he plays this character, Hiroyama, and he's widowed and he is a nice, polite guy. He you know, this is a very likable actor. Um and like a couple of other Fizz movies and kind of like the Naruse movie, uh, you know, a lot of these melodramas revolve around the father and or, and or mother, but usually it seems like the father. Okay, what am I going to do? My, my daughter isn't married yet. <laughs> hmm. We've got to resolve this. <laughs> and it's like a big thing. Like, we've got to arrange we've got to do it. You know, we got to do this <laughs> ritual and you know, it's so, it's so, I mean, to me, 
not artistically at all. To me personally, I find that utterly repulsive. But uh-huh. <laughs> but but that's just me. I mean, I don't know. Arranged marriage might really get some people going. Mm-hmm. That's to me, it's I like mean, gross. Actually, this is an interesting point. Arranged marriages statistically do actually work out better than non-arranged marriages just because people go into it treating it like a contract so it's like as long as you're not forced to do that it actually is a very effective way to live your life um which is fascinating to me i learned about this in uh my cross-cultural psychology class in undergrad um really really interesting so yeah i've always hoped that people who've just fell in love and decided to get married made that contract and treated it the same way you'd think But and we, obviously, but some marriages, you, you, some love marriages, work out beautifully, and some of them all, do. Uh, no, all three. Bill, all three Bill and his wife sound them. incredibly happy. Me and my <laughs> wife are incredibly happy. Yeah, you know, but <laughs> probably it, it, it's probably more likely. A range marriage is more likely to work. I think if you're raised in a culture where that was always yes. the expectation. Yeah, if somebody, yeah. If, if, they, if any of if us they tried to bring to, like, it into that, America, it would probably be very weird, and exactly. we wouldn't yeah. like it. Yeah, yeah. like no way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes. There's just so the audience, if in case you haven't figured it out, you know, all three of us are divorcees. So. <laughs> <We> know, <laughs> Been there, right? done that, remarried. Yep. Mm. yep. <laughs> life, life milestone. So, yeah. uh, so in this film, he's worried about his daughter. Uh, let me see you there. What's this daughter's name? I think her name's Michiko. Michiko, um, which is the character name that appears a lot in uh, Ozu and Narusa. Um, excuse me played by Shima Iwashida. And uh, she has her heart set on this one guy. And uh, it turns out he's engaged of his own volition to this woman that he loves. Uh, and he's relaying this information to her older brother and uh, Koichi. And Koichi's a, a really nice, relaxed guy. He's kind of the calm guy in the household. Um, the other have another brother who is married uh and having some money problems he actually uh, asked to borrow some money <laughs> for a cri- or some christmas tree or something like that and uh for a Hirayama, christmas tree okay <laughs> yeah christmas tree and things you know related to that uh, ritual and uh, <laughs> uh Hirayama gives it to him and he buys these two what he considers flawless brilliantly crafted golf clubs that are black metal and they're just like he like fetishizes them it's an it becomes an almost unintentionally absurd scene and because you know the brother is trying to a brother-in-law is trying to talk tell him you know come on man don't do this you can't pay for it and his wife's like i'm not i'm not helping you pay for that uh 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 hell no way you never you never uh pay for what i want and and then she's like Okay, I'll tell you what. We'll we'll pay for the golf clubs. I'll help you finish paying for it. And and then she lists like ten things that he immediately needs to make sure that are bought for her. <laughs> <laughs> and I just loved that whole thing. Like she's like taking up for herself and being like, "Yeah, I'm sorry, man. You know, uh, it's not all about you, bro." Um, and especially the absurdity of it being the golf clubs because he doesn't seem like he's a golf pro he's wanting to be a golf pro mm. so it's really just like a boyish fetish he has so that's one of the subplots uh there aren't too many but <coughs> the movie moves forward basically and, and endears it to me with Hirayama meets with these five guys they went to middle school together so now 40 years later they're meeting. They meet every year at this restaurant. And the restaurant is called uh, Wakamatsu, uh, which I'm, uh, means Young Pine. And uh, I had a character named Wakamatsu in my story, coincidentally, but I didn't know it meant that. It's a restaurant. And and they, you know, sit on the floor, kind of like I am at the table. And then they drink. And they drink. And they talk. And they tease with each other. And there's some sly, sly humor in it. I mean, they kind of rib each other. And a couple of them are kind of like that are either widowed or whatever circumstance are kind of like, yeah, I'm getting remarried. I, I think young wives are the way to go, man. <laughs> and, and you know, they think they're kind of smooth. They're not unlikable. They're just 
it's weird to see this proper these proper Japanese uh, salary men talking like this, like talking like male bros. <laughs> it's like it's like transnational male bonding and um he's like uh but it's funny and and, and the one guy's like yeah I, I there's one i really like and they're like oh everybody's matter of fact though you know this is not a melodramatic movie um you know here he was like how old is she he's like she's 24 and the other guy's like that's great you know you should do it you know younger wives are better and I'm staying out of this personally because of my experiences um, <laughs> and my parents. Um, but the the thing is, uh, you know, uh, there's one guy, um, Kawai, who's like the best friend of Hirayama. He's like his buddy. And, you know, the things they say to each other. Well, one thing they say is if to this one guy, if you're going to get a younger wife, you're going to have to start buying those pills again in order to make your new wife happy. So I'm like, Viagra, 1962. Wow. <laughs> Proto-Viagra. <laughs> and it's just so... I took that in a very different way when you said that. I was just like, are we talking like happy pills? Like, what the... No, 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 they're definitely talking... I, no, I, that's, I, that's I, totally fine. That is totally yeah, no. Fine. They're making fun of the just, fact that they think, you know, he's old, he can't get it up. But, you know, they're not going to say mm -hmm. that in a 1962 Japanese movie. Now in, a 19, now, in a 1968 Japanese pinky romance, pinky Roman movie, hell yeah, they're, they're not just going to say it. They're going to fucking show it. Right. Anyway, so, and, and then he'll probably get his penis chopped off, you know. But uh, so, <laughs> so in this case, <laughs> these guys are just like, yeah, yeah, you know, they're all buddies. So there's this outlier character who I think steals like the whole fucking movie, and I want to get his uh, deal right here. His name is Sakuma, Sakuma, um, and uh, he uh, is played by an actor named Ijiro. I, I no Ijiro Tono. Don't know who he is. Anyway, he was their literature teacher, but he's not a whole lot older than him. Kind of like in your situation with with college kids so he was a young classics teacher and uh they have a nickname for him called he Hiotan, which means the gourd so in all of the subtitles they call him the gourd like a gourd you know like a pumpkin relative and i'm like well, i wonder where that nickname comes from <laughs> but i yeah they never explain why i mean what? they make these no they make, they make these I need to know hints. this. <laughs> well they make hints and some of the hints are just Oh, ble well, like I said, okay, here's what I've established from hearsay from Tim, uh, not our Tim, Tim McLean. Osu was an alcoholic. You know, he loved to drink. He, well, he may not have been an alcoholic, but he loved to drink. It might have been one of the things that killed him at 60, might not. It's very casual in these movies. So in Tokyo Twilight and Tokyo Story, it, it's casual and it's, and, and, you know, you watch the characters, they're talking. Now, if you're watching its movie, who? I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know who would be fit under this anymore, even teenagers. But like, I didn't get drunk until I was thirty. But if you're watching this movie and you've never been even buzzed with alcohol, you're not gonna get what's happening, you know. But <laughs> if you, but if you've been buzzed and been drunk, if you've tried different liquors and you've gradually gone up, then you, hey, hey, let's have have about this much sake too you know and then they keep going you know by the end of the night you know what's gonna you have an idea of what they're gonna be feel like and that's what's beautiful because it's conveyed but it's not like oh god somebody gets up drunk and it's all melodramatic it's just like they're kind of staggery little and and mm -hmm. then the friend then the friend will be like ah oh, come on back you yeah, have another one try this one and and uh, oh, Kaiwai, his friend, is like an avuncular character because not only does he advise the younger characters on the, that marital situation, uh, he's real smooth and sly. He's a real cool dude. And he also has great taste in food. I was like slobbering watching this. And he's got all these, pl you know, pl platters. 
and uh, he pays for everybody whenever they go to the restaurant. And he has different kinds of alcohol. He's like, oh, try this, try this kind. This will really be great for you. And uh, they name a couple, but most of them they don't. The problem is Hirayama is depressed, really, because he's going to lose his daughter. She's going to get married. And uh, the thing is, you know, the guy she had her heart on is our heart on oh, is our is not already taken. Um, and you know, the, the son Koichi is just he's just a loser with that fucking golf club fetish. And so, um, Michiko, you know, what, what, what happens with uh, Hirayama is he keeps drinking, like he'll drink with the buddies and then he'll kind of go home and have a little drink, and his you know, daughter will say something. Then he goes to a bar. And he goes to the bar, and when he goes to the bar, he meets a guy who served under him in the military in World War II. So then they start remembering these, well, okay, this is my name for them, it's not, these propaganda songs. <laughs> and I, they don't translate the lyrics to them, I don't think. A couple of them. They're nothing really offensive. They're kind of kind of silly. But they're patriotic. And and so Hirayama's kind of like really reminded of the past and where he's at now. And so finally, the next thing you know, uh, Kimiko's having a wedding. So that's the ellipsis. You have no idea if, if, how Kawhi fixed them up. You have no idea. You never saw it. You didn't see any, none of the dangling subplots like with the gourd. Not, none of that's gone. So may never have existed so they they uh have a wedding and they watch some uh some theatrical thing that has some crazy looking person in a dragon outfit and then uh hirayama of course you know comes home and he he keeps drinking and he's like he starts singing one of those hymns and i, I read this because i had forgotten it from the subtitles and then the last thing he says his head's kind of tilted almost to where he's looking at you and he's got that where you're drunk. This is me. Like when I'm drunk, I start doing this thing where my head is now like this. And then he's like alone. Eh. And that's the end. So the end, what's the conclusion? Life goes on. You know, yep. um, is Hirayama going to drink himself to death? Maybe he's not. Maybe not everybody who drinks all the time is an alcoholic. I know that for a fact. But, you know, this movie gives you a lot of subtle things to think about and like you know in the culture and and in relationships and with social customs and rituals and you know addictions and whatever so mm -hmm. i think and i it's supposedly ozu's most well-reviewed movie is considered his masterpiece i didn't know any of that going into this i was just like i've seen a couple of his movies that are named after times of the year because he's got about seven movies like that he has about 30 other movies but I've seen a few and I was like, yeah, I'll check this out. It's framed really well. It's usually medium shots and they're at the table. Everything's very square. You know, it's not, it's like centered, but it's not boring. You know, most usually if you're a little like I am a little to the left, that's the ideal framing, but like they're in the middle and they're in the middle of like, but all these squares, like their houses and they're, you know, Hirayama's house is much more, well appointed than a lot of houses you see in the more poor Japanese characters. I mean, he doesn't have paper walls, you know. I mean, he and uh, he's very modern. Um, and, and this, and then they'll cut to a you know one shot, and it's just brilliant, brilliant technically, but it's so subtle. Everything about it is subtle, really. And I think it would like if I'd seen it in 1995, for instance, I was seeking out Japanese movies, I got into the idiot around that time no 94 and but if i saw this one i probably would have i probably would have appreciated it just because it was different but i probably wouldn't have really gotten mm -hmm. it like louis Boonwell, everybody told me he's this raging savage satirist so at mm -hmm. that time i'm like i'm like digging for like the craziest goriest most extreme subversive politically subversive movies i can find so when i see Boonwell, i'm like uh yeah, I like it, but like this isn't this isn't that at all. And then a few years later I watch the same movies and I'm like, oh my God, he's telling the church and the state, fuck off. Yes. And a friend of mine oh, well. I used to work with named Rocky, he said, 
He said, you can attack the establishment two ways. You can either use the razor or the cudgel. I find the razor more effective. And that's Boonwell's the razor. And yeah. literally, yeah, in, literally. In, the first movie, yeah. he used, in the first movie, he uses the cudgel figuratively, but he literally fucking uses the yeah. razor. So mm -hmm. anyway, so that is my report on an afternoon, an autumn afternoon. Nice. Cool. Do you have any more, Bill? I got one last one. Yay! One last Maybe one. Maybe Keith will pop see. back up. Um, <laughs> and this is this is a, I think this is a masterpiece. Maybe everyone else knows about it, but I didn't. Uh, Kuro Nico. I, I, I have again, it on Blu-ray. Ah, there you go. So you're way ahead of me. Wow. But, but I I'd never seen it until I ordered it in a half sale. I just read heard yeah. things about it. Black Cat in a Bamboo Grove, or just also known as the Black Cat. 1968. Mm. Uh, you know, you know what I was saying before about how uh, samurai don't always come off so great. Well, this is one of those. It's um, it's basically two uh, women who are raped and murdered by a bunch of scumbag samurai, mm. and uh, they come back as uh, <laughs> cat spirits, basically. Um, mm -hmm. Just, I just watched this on Halloween, so it's yeah. Really fresh. Good. It's it's really cool. So so the director um, Kanito Shindo is the one who did oh, An Anibaba, awesome. Anibaba, mm -hmm. which everyone's heard. Anibaba is my favorite. Japanese it's a great. Horror. It's a that's a great movie. But this one, I, I I really love the again the photography here. They're not going. It, it's it's weird because he kind of was known for like social realism and stuff, and this is the most un yeah. unrealistic thing possible. It's it's yeah. film, it's like filmed kabuki. There, right. the lighting is yeah. is very. Um, it looks it, it has has the kind of vibe of a, a fairy tale, yeah, a, gr a grim fairy tale, but but a fairy tale and and mm -hmm. gorgeous black and white photography. The use of lighting that is not realistic but is is really compelling. The uh, now the first half I think is better than the second half. The first half we get right into these these women yeah. murdering these samurai tearing their throats out and they're probably using chocolate syrup for blood, but it's so delicious. Now are we, have we jumped to own a Bob or are we still on? Kuro no, this Nico? is a, uh, yeah. Corey Nico. Uh, that Ani Baba is a great movie, but I figure only Baba, they do that. some of those kind of things too, but that's yeah. a whole nother. Yeah. Uh, that, and that devil mask is just oof, oof, shock. iconic, but, iconic, but this one. So, you know, basically the, these women, they're murdered. They come back as spirits. The, the, authorities can't handle the fact that dead samurai are showing up every single night and and so they they get some guy to find the best warrior to uh kill these spirits but of course the guy mm -hmm. they find is connected to them so there's tragedy and just this is a cool spooky genuinely cool horror movie and uh, mm -hmm. again i was just not aware of it it was when i just started looking around it's like how oh, can maybe i'll do a whole theme on cat movies from japan and this one this one came up it's great had, you, had really. you heard of it before no no again oh, just wow slipped right, slipped right by me i think i think yeah. you know when people would talk about hey here's some great here's some great japanese horror movies they they'd find this guy and they would just do anibaba and like well he's had his shot now we're not going to do i find for a lot of these great directors who are famous for one film there's another film that they also did that's just as good maybe better, better and definitely not as well known it's kind of like when when an artist yeah. a, a musical artist is known for one album or one song mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there's there's another one that maybe wasn't a top 10 hit maybe didn't get all the attention but really it's it's better in some yeah way. that often happens like the most popular songs are like they're fine you see why they do well and then you like sure. dig a little bit and you're just like oh but this though this really speaks to me yeah, yeah I like the i like the deep cuts in all the arts i'm like that yeah uh like with onababa i wanted to say i used to have it on dvd i watched it every halloween and i watched it an extra time each year so i've seen it about 25 times <laughs> the dvd i sold it because i'm you know i have my ebay store i haven't bought they finally put it on blu-ray like only like a year ago but i can't afford it but i'm like at least it's on blu-ray it's just so stunning to to look at and you're right about Shindo. Shindo wrote a lot of other people's scripts, and they were kind of more social realism. But it seems like his directorial hand is more, yeah, more more avant-garde, more more uh, yeah. 
supernatural. Um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the director I want to talk about just real quick. Cause you know, I'm just going to throw a few people out there since we've all got our picks done, but uh, Masaki Kobayashi, uh, I think is one mm-hmm. of the masters. Uh, he did, um, well, he did the human condition. First mm-hmm. of all, you know, parts one, two, and three, all each one, it's three hours. I've only seen part one. Uh, and they're about world war two. And a lot of people consider them the greatest war movies ever made. Um, though most Americans don't ever heard of them. Now they star my man, Tatsuya Nakadai, more about him in a minute. Um, and that guy from An Autumn Afternoons and one of them to the old guy. <laughs> He's in everything. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Kobayashi did the those. Kobayashi did a lesser known film called Samurai Rebellion hmm. with Mifune. And it is incredible. I mean, near the end, I, I don't remember all the plot. I've got the DVD. It's one I've debated selling or not because I don't know if it's going to come out on Blu-ray or not. But basically, Mifune ends up kind of on the run and he's trying to save a baby. And he's in, of course, he's in a big thing, you know, field with stalks, you know, like an Onobaba. They love to do that. And he's desperate. And I mean, it is like tearful. I mean, it's like incredible of acting. Anyway, uh, but, you know, he did Kwaidan. So Kwaidan is, you know, to some people, the greatest Japanese horror film ever. Uh, it's taken me over the years to appreciate it, I'll be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nakadai is in one of the stories, you know, it's an anthology. It has beautiful photography, color photography, and uh, it's very long. Uh, but it's really grown on me a lot. Uh, but the, his that really resonates with me uh kobayashi is harakiri uh oh great movie uh, yeah so good. that was a good one so Hatsio good. Nakadai, and the first time i watched it you know i'm watching it and it it goes back exactly what y'all were talking about the authority thing of the shogun mm-hmm. and how they're kind of corrupt they're like gangsters basically and you know they fuck over this guy's like son-in-law and make him commit harakiri for the most ridiculous reasons. And so he goes to plead their case. And of course the movie is him pleading their case and then showing the whole story in flashback until you get toward the end. And, you know, he's stepping forward and, you know, I I was watching it the first time. And I was kind of like, is what's going to happen? What I think is going to happen at that time. I had not seen a lot of samurai movies, Mm -hmm. just a few. (laughs) So if I had, I would have been like, yeah, this is what's going to happen next. (laughs) But, but he's stepping forward and they're, they're talking shit to him. And he's, he's just like calmly basically telling them. Yeah. They're unjust, Mm -hmm. you know, basically like you're evil, you're corrupt. And, you know, basically like time for some karma, baby, but he's not mean and menacing. He's calm and he looks cool as shit. Not that I always look cool as she is. I mean, I'm I'm a hetero, but he's a handsome, handsome man. And he <laughs> has like the little the little uh, mustache here. He looks so incredible. And, and then they're just like, I forgot who makes the first step. But then it's like he draws the sword, and it's him against all the shoguns. And it goes on for a while, and it's amazing. And the first time I watched it, I was just like breathless you know i had not i had not mm-hmm. seen a samurai movie now i've seen some since but i've not seen a samurai movie where the one guy's facing them and a you're totally empathizing with the guy rooting for him and b it just keeps going and somehow he's able to keep going and he's injured and he keeps going and it, it's incredible i mean it just it boy it you know just simmers until it boils and then it just explodes and uh there's a flip side film to that called Sword of Doom by Okamoto, uh, mm-hmm. which also stars Tatsuya Nakadai playing a totally different character. Now, we were talking about uh, arch villains and evil protagonists. So this character, Ryanusuke Chikoi, Ryanusuke Chikoi, he is an evil protagonist. And he, you know, he's an evil samurai. He's a ronin. He loves to kill, but he loves to kill people. Mm-hmm. He's, just, he's just down with it. Now, near the end, he finally gets cornered 
And he's just like, let you know, bring it on. And he's actually he's a little drunk in a movie. He's a little depressed over his wife. I don't know if, if, if she finally left him or died or something. You finally see tiny glint of humanity, but not enough to really feel sorry for him. <laughs> and um he's he's confronted by this. He's like unleashed some gang he, he fucked over that he was supposed to be doing this contract work with. And you know, it's just like the mob. And uh they come to get him and he's just going at it. They slice him a few times. He's going at it and he's just like drunkenly and he's still killing people right and left. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then it freezes on him. Yeah. And you don't know if he lives or dies. And I thought the message to me from the filmmaker, uh, and there was a quote similar to this in the criterion thing was that he's going to keep fighting and fighting. Okay. He dies. He dies. Yeah. But th that's not the point. The point is he's going to keep on going and because, but his motivations are not very sympathetic. You admire his survival mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> skills now, you know, but it's not like a uh, scorpion. So sorry. She just keeps going and going no matter what, but you're rooting for her. They're like, yeah. I want her to rip the head off that guard, you know, um, yeah, you know, I wonder. I, I, I love that film, and I, I, that that freeze frame always stuck with me. And I, I kind of wonder if if part of the attitude, the Japanese have this conflicting attitude toward it. I mean, the samurai are portrayed as great warriors, and ideally, there's a nobility to to you know the the bushido code and everything. Although a lot of it is just how poorly it's followed. In the same mm -hmm. way that, you know, knights were supposed to be the knight, knights were supposed to have a sense of honor, but Absolutely. Would often, often were more like Game of Thrones knights who were scumbags. Um, <laughs> but, you know, some of these samurai, some of these samurai mm -hmm. movies, the, the message I get from it is that having the samurai meant total permanent war. That, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when, you're, when your purpose is to kill, there will always be killing. And I wonder if some of these yeah. films were kind of like, you know, this is why the samurai had to be, as they were, violently suppressed. You know, it's interesting now we look at the movie The Last Samurai and they're the heroes, the the, the samurai. Well, the, the, the Ronin, the Ronin are the heroes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the the Sogan you know, are the villains. Right, right. Oh, they're always bad. But you know, I got to go. But um, it'd be okay. interesting to maybe do, do a, an episode just on Japanese war movies because it occurs to me just how... Yeah. It's it's a unique yes. it's a unique thing because Japan, you know, we we Americans love their war movies, but that's because we mostly win our wars. It's always fun to make a movie where you win, and we've managed to even turn like the times we lose the Alamo. It's like yeah, but then a couple of weeks later we we you know <laughs> we pretty much beat the whole Mexican army. Yeah. So you know you turn even defeat into victory three hundred. The winners write history, but yeah. Japan. Japan, I mean, they lost a war as thoroughly as you can be lost. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the only and thing they make that, damn good war movies. They make great war movies and everything, but there's the, you know, the fact mm -hmm. that it all came down to nothing. I mean, they were completely and thoroughly destroyed. And and in the end, and I don't know if this may even be a, a greater, in a sense, a humiliation, although it's it's a good one. They survived only because their enemy, once they had completely defeated them, no longer felt the need to do what quite possibly they would have done if the situation was reversed, which is kill everyone and salt the earth. You know, Japan was then raised up by the very people that had bombed them almost into oblivion. Although I was mm. surprised to find out that Japan, percentage wise, did not lose nearly as much of its population to the war as certainly not russia or germany not uh, they, russia no yeah, you know <laughs> definitely not uh, russia <laughs> you know so it's, it's, uh, yeah yeah i mean it's it's, it's it's not it's not the numbers it, to me it's the way it was done and you know yes. I, i'm i'm against nuclear <laughs> weapons so me i think too, that yeah. was yeah I, and it's, you know, it's like, like the horror of it and like i even yeah. thought about talking about some of the like um like uh you know documentaries that were made shortly after the war um oh, there was yeah. one that was made like right after uh like right after the bombs fell and horrific absolutely horrific you know you're gonna watch it you're gonna have a bad time uh yeah. it's it's intense you're not gonna believe what you see because <laughs> what a lot of people don't understand they think is science fiction 
mm-hmm. but it's science it's fact real. is yeah. is that atomic bombs literally change matter down to the molecular they can mm-hmm. they don't always down to the molecular level so you have people who uh for instance their kimono all the designs are burnt onto their skin mm-hmm. permanently yep. you have shadow shadows of dead people and the shadow is yeah. kept on the wall i mean we're talking like supernatural shit there but it's, it's science it's just like really advanced mm-hmm. you know shit and to me it was too advanced to use so soon and to use that way and that's what humanity does. And you right sure now. as shit shouldn't be dropping it on cities where people live. Yeah. Like, oh my no. god. I mean, in the last but year... then but then more people died in the firebombing of Tokyo than died in the bombing of Hiroshima. I mean And I still disagree with that. Well, so. well you know, or Dresden <laughs> yeah. or Dresden. You know, yeah, you know, no, no, to me it's you don't nuclear, see too many people it's getting nuclear upset issue, about all the Germans but, that were yeah. killed though. It's yeah. it's a it's a dicey thing. I mean, in the one sense, I do think this though: if we had not dropped the atomic bomb, if people had not seen what atomic bombs do, the first time they would have been used would have been U.S. versus Russia, and it would have mm. been hundreds of bombs. It Those, could have been a lot worse, yeah. But you know, it's still it's you sort still of have to see though. it. You sort of have to see it to realize it's not something you want to see again. Well, my but, last statement before you have to go, Bill, is. In the last year, just coincidentally, I've I've seen the uh, Japanese movie Hiroshima, which is like a sort of docudrama. I think it came out in the seventies or sixties. Yeah, I've seen Children of Hiroshima by it's by one of the major filmmakers we mentioned tonight, but I forgot. I've seen Black Rain by Nakamura, and um, there's one other I've seen. And after all that, you know, I really. I really can't support a movie like Oppenheimer. Mm. I, I don't I don't care what his conflicts were. I just to me, whether he meant to be or not, he's a war criminal. And I, I just I it's, can't you know it's it's you it's know. An inter- I mean it's an interesting debate. If you hey. see him as a fictional yeah. character, it's okay. Have but you, if you remember it was a real guy, yeah. You have know. you seen have you seen the Japanese movie about the rape of Nanking? <laughs> yes. It's yeah. pretty graphic. Yeah, that one is uh, graphic. Yeah, I've seen one, all the that, Chinese torture movies. Yeah, but you mostly got to see the Chinese version. You know, listen, yeah, war is a horrible thing, which is why you it probably is. shouldn't wage it. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually have an interpretation of the original Gojira that goes against everything I've heard. You know, it's all it's always said that Godzilla is a metaphor for the atomic bomb, and there's something to be said for that. He's got atomic breath and and all. But to me, the real metaphor is the oxygen destroyer, the oxygen mm. destroyer, which is the ultimate, uh, this super scientific weapon, so horrific that the creator doesn't want to use it, but feels he has mm-hmm. no choice because it's the only way to stop Godzilla. So if you if you play around with that, it's like the oxygen destroyer is the bomb. Mm-hmm. It, it, it had to be used to destroy Godzilla. What is that? What does that make Godzilla? Is Godzilla the representation of militarism that had taken over Japan and and had to be destroyed? Although the, it's interesting that the guy they use the oxygen destroyer, but then the creator kills himself so that it's never used again. Mm-hmm. So it acknowledges that this weapon is uh, unthinkable, and yet it's the only thing that can be used. That subplot with him is so great. Like, does he have an eye patch? The doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in in the original Gojira, it's it's more played up that he had been he had been working with the Germans with the Nazis. Um, oh, okay. You know, um, yeah. So he was himself. You know, had some interesting things. It's a great movie. It really is, and it's amazing that it worked. Um, but it's well, so check fun. it out, guys. Yeah, check it out, anyway. guys. I know you yeah. can go. We're, what I'm going to uh, do is we're, we're going to oh, wrap sorry. up. Uh, I, yeah. I want to talk to Caitlin about some stuff, but I'm going to obviously hit the record button before that. But just to wrap up, if, in case anybody is seeing this as a standalone episode, <laughs> and just in general, uh, thank you for you guys, and thanks for the last the last two standing with me. And <laughs> like and subscribe, like and subscribe, please. We love you, and we'll be back with more stuff soon. So take care, take care, take care.